Good morning, everyone. We'll start today's Metro COVID-9 press briefing with Mayor John Cooper, followed by Dr. Alex Jahangir, Chair of the Metro Board of Health and Metro Coronavirus Task Force. We're joined today by Dr. James Hildreth, the President and CEO of Meharry Medical College, Deputy Mayor Brenda Haywood, and Chief Steve Anderson of the Metro Nashville Police Department. Director Chief William Swan of the Office of Emergency Management and Nashville Fire Department, and Dr. Michael Caldwell, Director of Public Health, are here to help answer your questions. We'll begin with Mayor John Cooper. Good morning, Nashville. Today's COVID-19 case count is relatively lower than in the past few days, but our 14-day case average is showing a bit slightward upward trend. Now, given the recent uptick in these cases, we need more data to continue making well-informed public health decisions. We will continue phase two of the roadmap for reopening Nashville while examining our public health benchmarks every day and with the goal of starting phase three as soon as it's safely possible. On Tuesday, the Tennessee Department of Health reported the state's highest number of confirmed cases to date. Here in Davidson County, we've not seen a similar spike, but we must proceed with caution to protect our hard-earned progress and prevent the need to revert to an earlier phase in the roadmap. I know we are all eager to continue our reopening, and I'm grateful to all the hard work that local business owners have put into keeping their workers and customers safe. Your efforts have made our economic restart possible, and I urge everyone to continue observing all public health orders to safeguard your health. Dr. Alex Shehanger will present additional details about our latest COVID-19 data and related health metrics momentarily. Now, yesterday afternoon, President Obama challenged every mayor in the United States to review their local use of force policies and develop necessary reforms for the good of their communities. Now, I am proud to commit Nashville to this national conversation and encourage all mayors everywhere to take the My Brother's Keeper pledge. Now, locally, we will review our police use of force policies engage our black and other minority communities by including a diverse range of input, experiences, and stories in your review. And report the findings of our review to the community and seek feedback. And finally, reform our community's police use of force policies. Now, Eric Brown, Coordinator of Economic Opportunity and Empowerment and Youth Development, and John Bunton, the Director of Policy and Community Safety, will help represent the mayor's office in this vital and timely conversation. Nashville can set a new standard in policing, and I'm hopeful that this collaborative effort will bring further reconciliation as we all work together to address racial injustice in our community. Now, I want to welcome Chief Steve Anderson of the Metro Nashville Police Department, who is with us to discuss the department's commitment to this important use of force review and provide an update on MNPD's ongoing investigations. We're also joined this morning by Deputy Mayor Brenda Haywood, and I'm grateful to Deputy Mayor Haywood for organizing Tuesday night's prayer vigil with local faith leaders, and for taking the lead to further develop and open an honest dialogue between the mayor's office and leaders from Nashville's black community. And as always, it is a pleasure to welcome Dr. James Hildreth, President and CEO of Meharry Medical College, whose thoughtful insights as a community leader and educator have proved indispensable throughout our COVID-19 response. I also want to take a moment to encourage all Nashvillians to read Dr. Hildreth's op-ed published in today's Tennessean. Now, please remember, if you are exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19, call Metro's COVID-19 hotline at 615-862-7777, Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., Testing is free of charge at all three of our community assessment centers, so do not hesitate to call the hotline. And that number again is 615-862-7777. And as always, the COVID-19 Response Fund is available to those seeking direct financial, food, mental health, and social service assistance at the Metro COVID-19 website. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Alex Shahangir, Chair of Metro Coronavirus Task Force, who is joining us by video conference today. 
Thank you, Mayor Cooper, and good morning, Nashville. I had a conflict on my schedule this morning, so I'm joining you remotely, and I will be back on Monday morning. Here's the latest on coronavirus in Nashville and Davidson County. We now have 5,831 confirmed cases. That is an increase of 81 cases in the past 24 hours. 1,317 cases are currently active, and 4,448 residents, or 76% of all cases, have recovered and have been cleared. We did have an additional death reported to us yesterday, a 53-year-old female with underlying health conditions. That now makes 66 Nashvilleians who have died because of COVID-19. My sympathies go out to this person, as well as all of the other 65 individuals who passed away in our city. Today's number of new cases is back under 100. Over the past three days, the new case numbers were 130, 100, and 133. These high numbers are from residents who were tested after the Memorial Day weekend. As the mayor said, we will wait until next week to make a decision on entering phase three. The last few days did result in a slight increase in our 14-day rolling average trend. Now, it is concerning enough to, for us to slow down and see what happens over the next few days. We want to see more data before making that decision. However, I want to be very clear. This does not indicate that we have regressed or will need to regress or go back to phase one. Rather, we are going to continue what we are doing currently, review more data, and then make a decision on phase three in the next several days. Now, we've said from the start that the data will drive our decision, and that's exactly what we're doing here today. Now, an update on other metrics. Hospital bed availability is 21%, and available ICU beds are at 23%. An ebb and flow is typical for these numbers, especially as hospitals are opening up and performing more procedures. When we first announced the roadmap to Nashville, we set the scale of these numbers to be above 25% to be satisfactory or green. Now, after several months of monitoring these numbers, as well as consulting with um, our hospital system, it's become very clear that our hospital capacity um, could handle a surge at 20% or higher. So, as such, we are adjusting this metric to reflect this. And so both of these numbers now, the 21% for hospital bed capacity and the 23% for ICU bed capacity are satisfactory and in the green range. Now a reminder, the three community assessment centers and our assessment hotline is open today. These centers are open from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday, and our assessment hotline is open seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Please call at 615-862-7777 if you'd like to speak with a medical professional around your concerns regarding COVID. So, if you think you may have the virus, if you think you've been exposed to someone who does have the virus, or if you're just concerned, please come visit one of our sites or please come or call our assessment hotline. And finally, please continue to do your part in Nashville. Stay at home when possible. Keep your distance if you do go out. Wear a face covering and get tested if you have any concern about this virus. And take care of your loved ones. I will be available later to answer questions. And now I would like to introduce Dr. James Hildreth, President and CEO of McCary Medical College. Good morning, Nashville. Several days ago, in the midst of our fight against a deadly coronavirus, we all watched in absolute horror as a man named George Floyd, a black man, was murdered by a white police officer in Minneapolis, who, with Mr. Floyd handcuffed, lying face down on the ground, placed his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck for nine minutes, indifferent to Mr. Floyd's repeated pleas for his life. This incident pulled the cover back on another ongoing fight in America, the fight against hate and the fight to have the country live up to its creed of liberty and justice for all. Our fight against COVID-19 has lasted only four months, but in that time, the virus has taken the lives 
of 107,000 of our fellow citizens. I would have imagined that this number, 100,000 plus people dead, would be so shocking, so jarring, so unacceptable that the fight against COVID-19 would have galvanized our nation in a way that few things could. I find myself wondering whether the fact that most people who've died are black people, poor people, brown people, and old people, does that explain the reason why we've not been galvanized as a nation? I pray, fervently pray, that this is not the case, but all things considered, it's hard to draw any other conclusion. Like that officer who murdered Mr. Floyd, our nation seems indifferent to the incredible toll that COVID-19 is having in some of our communities. The national fight against hate has been going on just a bit longer than the fight against the virus, 401 years to be exact, and has left countless African Americans and indigenous people dead. As with the fight against COVID-19, indifference on the part of well-meaning people who feel that the issue does not involve them has also been a significant challenge in the fight against hate. Like the virus, the hate and oppression that's been a part of the lives of minorities for centuries is invisible to most people in this country. The murder of Mr. Floyd shone a bright light on that hate and made it visible to the country and to the world. And the absolute cruelty and indifference of the act itself was such that for most human beings, at a visceral level, indifference was no longer an option and their voices had to be heard. The indifference to hate and to COVID-19 will surely prevent us from having victories in these two battles. And the bottom line is that indifference is no longer an option if we want to put these two things behind us. Marches and rallies continue to happen around the country and here in Nashville. I urge all of us to remember that while our voices need to be heard so that we can put the indifference behind us, we also have to put indifference to COVID-19 behind us. We need to continue to take steps to mitigate the virus spread while we take part in marches and rallies. We should wear masks, try to maintain distance with others, and avoid bringing the virus home to the people that we love by decontaminating our clothing, clothing and face coverings before we have contact with them. Nashville, we've actually done a really good job up to this point in controlling the spread of COVID-19. We flattened the curve. In fact, we smashed the curve. Public and private organizations have collaborated in a really wonderful way. It's kind of the envy of other cities. And many fewer people have died than in other cities our size. These victories came about through weeks of mitigation, staying at home, wearing face coverings, hand washing and the like. And as noted, the large gatherings to protest against hate and give voice to our collective anger and despair and pain are really important. But we must not let these gatherings set us back in our fight against COVID-19, especially given the fact that the virus is disproportionately affecting the people who are the subject of the hate that we're protesting. So by all means, let us not go back. Let's let our voices be heard but in doing that, let's keep the virus in mind as well. So, Nashville, as always, we've got this. And let us continue to do things to not become a vector for COVID-19. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Deputy Mayor Brenda Haywood. I would just like to um, say thank you to Mayor Cooper and uh, pay homage to Dr. Hildred. His commentaries are always so timely and so meaningful, and we look forward to them. I just want you to know, of course, my name is uh, Deputy Mayor Brenda Haywood. And in 1963, myself and three other little black girls integrated Stratford High School here in Nashville. 
And at that time, racism was at the forefront of our society. And that was quite a number of years ago. And I want you to know that it saddens me to know that here in 2020, we really have not come that far. And the battle cry has become, I can't breathe. I want you to know there's a difference in I can't breathe and taking a breath and having a knee that's to your neck. And after several minutes, you are lifeless. Well, I want you to know that there are many of us that are still walking around with not the ample supply of air that's needed to do the things that we were birthed here on earth to do. I also want to share that there's a difference in breathing freely and being on life support. Well, it's time for the machines and the knees to be removed. Therefore, it leads me to share with you that Mayor Cooper has spoken with me and we will be having community meetings to listen to the voices of the people that are crying out. The pain is real. I have suffered the pain and I still suffer pain. So we're gonna host uh, community meetings to hear firsthand from all stakeholders regarding the need for change and the need for reform. We want to listen to each other, and we want to work together in this community, and we want to be an instrument of change. And we want you to know that there in Mayor Cooper's office, we realize that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So please know that Mayor Cooper, along with myself and other staff members, will be working together to bring about the appropriate change. Thank you. Thank you, Dep <clears throat> Deputy Mayor Haywood. And now I'd like to introduce Chief Steve Anderson uh, of the Metro Nashville Police Department. Good morning, Nashville. Let me echo the remarks of Mayor Cooper concerning the policies of the Metropolitan Police Department, especially uh, concerning the use of force. And let me tell you that over my career here, that's been a constant evolution. And going back to 1982, when, uh, when drastic changes were cha uh, made in the aftermath of a Supreme Court decision. And then especially since the year 2000, continuing to refine those policies, uh, we participate with the Police Executive Research Forum uh, in researching, uh, carrying out the practicalities. Uh, we have sent people as far away as Scotland to study what they were doing. And actually, uh, our instructors are chosen many times to uh, provide use of force instruction uh, consistent with the PERF guidelines uh, in other major cities uh, across the nation. Our policy is uh, modeled uh, closely uh, with the International Association of Chiefs of Police model policy. And we are a leader in terms of what other major city police departments are doing. The uh, de-escalation, that's been a part of our policies and training uh, for a number of years, again, going back to the year 2000 and gradually uh, evolving and changing those. Um, we're a good police department and we have good policies. But th all of those are subject to review at any time. And we certainly welcome any criticism uh, and any advice on what we can do better. Uh, we certainly do not want to let the good that we are stand in the way of being great. So over the last week, since last Saturday night, uh, our investigators uh, have been investigating uh, all the vandalism, arson, other criminal events uh, that occurred. Uh, we have been joined uh, by the Nashville Fire Department, arson investigators. We've been joined by the Tennessee B Bureau of Investigation, 
the Tennessee Department of Homeland Security, uh, the TBI, TBI, as I mentioned, FBI, and the ATF. Um, District Attorney General Glenn Funk has been very helpful in making sure that he's been personally available to assist us in lodging the proper charges, make, making sure appropriate bail has been set. Don Cochran, the United States Attorney for the Middle District of Tennessee, uh, has uh, been very helpful and offered his staff uh, at every step of the way. I should tell you that over this last week, an arrest to Mr. Summers was arrested for arson, setting fire to the courthouse. Uh, just yesterday, uh, Mr. Clark was arrested for assisting uh, and co-conspiring with uh, Mr. Summers. Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald was arrested uh, for destroying the plaque, uh, the civil rights plaque on the front of the courthouse. We know that there was at least three other people assisting him and were actively looking for them. And then Mr. Hamer was arrested again uh, for vandalism, breaking out windows in the courthouse. We need the public's help. Each of these arrests were made with the assistance of the public. So you'll be seeing pictures in days to come of various videos that we've looked at, still pictures uh, from our own city uh, equipment and also from uh, uh, videos that uh, the public has sent to us. So please, please, policing is a community effort. This police department uh, would be somewhat helpless without the assistance of the public. So we invite your assistance. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone responsible uh, is brought before the courts. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Anderson. We'll now begin taking media questions, starting with Nancy Ammons at WSMB. Nancy. Hi, thank you. I um, have a question for um, Chief Anderson, please. What role um, did Antifa play in the March 31st events at the courthouse and at Central Precinct? Another question for the chief. How do you feel you can improve relations with the COB? Thank you. Chief Anderson. So Antifa... I think uh, everybody has that organization, a loose organization as it is, on their minds. Uh, we, we are speculating at this point. Uh, we hope to develop uh, additional proof, evidence, uh, that some faction was actively involved and organized. But uh, I will leave that to the investigators. And again, again, the public's help would be very important. As to the COB, I think that we sat down and discussed things as opposed to issuing public statements. Uh, and um, as I said earlier, uh, we should not argue about the things that we've already reduced to writing. And uh, we should define what each of our roles are and act accordingly. Thank you. Nate Rao at the Tennessee Lookout. Nate. Hey, good morning. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, it's for Mayor Cooper. Regarding the RNC possibly coming to Nashville, what's your personal opinion about whether you want it here or not based on the political unrest and also the city's public health situation? Thank you, Nate. Mayor Cooper. Um, thank you, Nate, and the Tennessee Lookout. Um, of course, we're not surprised that they, uh, anybody would want to be here, uh, any national convention. Uh, and we look forward to the day when uh, conventions uh, routinely are back in Nashville. Um, but there's certainly no money available from us for uh, hosting this event. But also, let's look forward to another event uh, that we are budgeted to help with, and that is to support Belmont in the hosting of the presidential debate later this year. So I do expect Nashville to be the site of a significant national um, political event already scheduled and already booked. Um, and I do look forward to our convention business being reestablished. But uh, in the end, um, you know, our current, let's just be clear, our current health protocols, which we have been very careful to establish and publicly identify, would not support this. The whole country is hoping 
that they get to the phase where we can get back to business as normal. But of course, the specifics of your question is, would current health protocols allow an indoor gathering of that size? Of course, they wouldn't, or for hockey games either. Um, but we're all looking forward to a day when we're on the other side of this. Ian Jung at the Tennessean. Good morning. Uh, I wanted to ask a question for Dr. Caldwell and Mayor Cooper. Uh, Metro Council this week had you know, passed a resolution to call for the end of the data sharing program or policy. Uh, what are your thoughts and do you want to honor that uh, resolution? And I also wanted to know how much of the data being shared is uh, being used as a percentage to help police. And is there any new changes on the timeline for the body camera program? Thank you. So the first two questions about are about data sharing, and then you had a follow-up question about uh, the body camera program. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Uh, Dr. Caldwell. Thank you. Good morning. In response to the feedback we've received, we are uh, taking steps to safeguard uh, the public health data and to ensure that this data always remains in the hands of the Department of Public Health. We've worked with the uh, Office of the Mayor to create a technical working group. Our goal is safety, keeping the data safe and keeping our first responders safe. This new technical team is working with our emergency dispatch vendor, Motorola, to set up this new system. And we're glad to get this technical advisory group started next week, and we will keep you posted. Uh, I can inform you that there have been uh, over 100 instances uh, when this data was used uh, specifically to inform first responders about a residence or a person that was COVID positive, and it has helped to protect them. Um, thank you, Yihan and the Tennessean. Um, we're engaged in active discussions with council members about their concerns about this program. There are different needs in the community that need to be served. I think we can work it out where everybody is served. We need to protect first responders too, and we also need to have a transparent environment where people have confidence uh, in their government and the ability to respond. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can um, actively resolve the questions about this. As to body cameras in the days ahead as we finalize the budget, I know uh, we want to be in active conversations with council members and order how to squeeze in these needed community priorities. We're in active discussions also with the vendors about how perhaps we can fast forward what we're trying to roll out in terms of body cameras, given the severe restrictions of our budget at this time. And again, uh, the property tax increase is um, sharp and difficult and indicates how little money really there is for vital government services. Um, but we're going to try to get it all squeezed in. Thank you. Julia Palazzo at WKRN. Julia. Good morning. Thank you. Um, Chief Anderson, I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about uh, Metro's plan today uh, in anticipation of the protest or protest planned. And just wanted to get your response to the calls made during the Metro Council meeting to defund the police. And Mayor Cooper, have you considered um, a curfew for tonight in anticipation of these planned protests? Thank you. Thank you, Julia. We'll start with Chief Anderson. So I make it a point, thank you for the question, by the way, it's very good. I make it a point not to discuss uh, details of contingency plans. Obviously, uh, when you have uh, a, a situation uh, that could go out of control, uh, we really don't want to reveal exactly what the resources are. 
And we make our plans based on our experience and our expectations. And then obviously Saturday night, based on the experience that we've had here in Nashville, the peaceful protest, uh, we geared up accordingly. Actually, we overstaffed, but that was not enough. Uh, so for tonight, we are hoping for a very peaceful demonstration. And we think that will occur. But if it does not, we will act accordingly. And, and our role is to protect all the citizens of, citizens of Nashville, uh, to protect life and property, and to protect those people that have gathered to peacefully express their ideas. They're in, they're in danger's way also. So uh, we will be prepared for tonight and act accordingly. I, as to the defunding, you know, I think Councilman Mendez may have said this best. It's not something that you might just do overnight. Uh, in, a, in a perfect world, we could devote resources to other things. It's been talked about education, health care, all of those things, to make people's lives better, uh, to put them in a situation where they do not resort to criminal activity. But that's not something that could actually occur in one year. So I look forward, uh, certainly, to uh, that better world and funding in those places that would help that. But meanwhile, uh, we have to have the people in place to protect all of the citizens of Nashville. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Julia. Uh, earlier this week, the Capitol was the site of an inspiring and peaceful event, and we um, I, I'm, there's no reason to think that that won't be today's outcome. Um, everyone in Nashville is going to be prepared otherwise, but right now we don't know of any specific uh, danger um, from this. The, all the parts of Metro government are going to be prepared for a response should that happen and a very quick response. But again, I want to just point back to already you have the example of something that was peaceful and that was inspiring and that was people's residents exercising their First Amendment rights. And separately from here, I do want to encourage everyone going to wear a mask and socially distance themselves. That's extremely important too, is uh, there's another kind of virus that we have to be fighting as well also. So there's not, um, but we're, we will be prepared to move quickly should the situation change. Um, but right now, I think Nashville has shown the ability to do the, the peaceful protest of a, of a message that needs to be heard um, already. And, and having it again is um, not only acceptable, it's, a, again, a blessed thing as people exercise the First Amendment rights here and anywhere else. Thank you. Stacy Case at Fox 17. Stacy. Yes, my question is for the mayor. Mayor, I know we've had a lot of crises back to back, the tornado, the pandemic, and now what happened on Saturday night. It's been very busy, but you have appointed an advisory group to look into how to spend Davidson County's $121 million allotment of the CARES Act money. Can you give us an update on when Nashville residents may see some of that money, and will it be used for rent, mortgage help, as some other cities are already doing? Mayor Cooper. Um, yes, thank you, Stacy. Back to normal business. Um, there are two separate groups, just to be careful. Um, one is a, sort of an informal brainstorming group that I've asked to assemble from time to time, and others will be too, as to how, how do we become a better city, a stronger city out of that, we, and how do we advocate with the state, which has a lot more COVID and CARES money, and how we can make our efforts complementary or supplementary to the state's efforts. If the state is going to make an investment in distance learning, then we would like to know that. We would like to advocate that with their share. And then what's not available, of course, then we need to know that it's on us to figure out how to implement. In general, the four responses, um, of course, we need to testing and public health and PPE to be available so that we can have an economic restart safely. Uh, we need um, jobs back. We need to get businesses comfortable to have the equipment that they need, the protocols and the testing to get restarted. We've got to get the economy restarted. 
Education and distance learning is clearly going to be a challenge. I think over the next few days we'll be having uh, announcements about that. I know Dr. Battle has been working tirelessly to uh, have an effective plan, as is Dr. Jahangir uh, and other school leaders in getting schools back. Frankly, that's a right around the corner in terms of the distance challenge. And then finally, the social safety net has to be a priority for us in getting our people through this, uh, hopefully with um, the least problems that they're going to be. Now, the second group is going to be a formal group. I think probably with the budget legislation, it's going to be formally organized, probably of about nine people comprised of council members and community leaders that will formally be supervising what is Nashville's bucket, the $122 million. But the state has a $5 billion bucket, a $2.3 billion through the Department of Finance and Administration. Knowing how they're going to spend it is going to inform our ability to meet community goals. Um, so there has to be a level of coordination and insight and working between the, the two operations. Um, the nine-member committee, I think, proposed by Chairman Mendez from Budget and Finance, we warmly endorse and look forward to its being formed. But that group will have not only how do you be a complementary effort in getting us restarted and our students back at school in a learning environment. We, don't, we also don't know the complete path of COVID. There may be an interruption later in the year. There may be a second outbreak, and so the need to reserve some of those resources in an active uh, preparation in case there's another outbreak will also have to be considered by all parties in this going forward. So it's a complex act of stewardship, but I think our community is up for it. But on a side, I would encourage anyone, please email me, go to the, our website and email me it, it, with your best ideas with your best ideas for um, how to have more justice in the community and how to repair our social safety net and then what we need to make our community feel safe and get to the other side. We need for in all of these challenges to end up with a stronger city on the other side of this, to take advantage of this difficult few months for Nashville to be on the other side, to have that city, and I am well, warmly want to welcome ideas that citizens have for what that looks like and how to make that happen. Alex Apple with Fox 17. My question is for Chief Anderson. Chief, um, as there's a brief policy review here, you even mentioned that you're finding most of the policies in the department to be good, but I'm curious where are a lot of our blind spots, and I'm talking about everyone, not just police, comes from is implicit bias. And do you talk to your officers about how to deal with their own implicit biases that they may or may not have? Uh, because that's something difficult for each of us to realize that we have. I imagine that's even more challenging when it comes to policing. Chief Anderson. Thank you again for that question. Uh, allow me to point out that yes, we do. Implicit bias uh, is something we all have. We can deny it, we all have it. Uh, so we have worked with national leaders and specific with PERF to provide that training, to provide that guidance. And that, that type of training and guidance is ongoing. Thank you, thank you for the question. Our last question today is from Harriet Wallace at Fox 17. Harriet. Yes, good morning. I've got uh, two questions for Dr. Jahangir and then a, a third for Mayor Cooper. Dr. Jahangir, with regards to the mask, um, do you believe that our delay in uh, passing out those masks could impact or is having an impact on the trend that we're seeing? Um, and will there be a process in maybe retrieving those masks that are now under review or investigation, if you will, because of a potential harmful chemical being on them. And would you wear that mask? And then my question for Mayor Cooper, Mayor Cooper, we've seen a previous mayor hold a number of citywide discussions 
many organizations in the African community continue to have discussions. What then is your plan to address the priorities that have been produced from those discussions already? The Metro Council, uh, excuse me, Minority Caucus of the Metro Council presented some to you. You discussed body cameras, but where do you stand on hiring a chief diversity officer and continuing to support um, the uh, COB? And how have you engaged the Minority Caucus? Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. We'll start with uh, Dr. Jahangir. Yeah, thank you so much, Harry, for the for the question. Um, in, in short, um, I, I think there's still lots to be learned about those masks. After, I mean, I was as surprised as everyone else when I heard um, the news a few days ago or whenever that came out. Um, so, in short, let me start by saying I would not wear the mask. That's my first answer, and I don't think there needs to be a formal process of retrieving the mask. I, I think just pass, spread the message. I, I, I wouldn't wear them, and, and until we learn more about them. Um, now, regarding um, distributing other masks and, and getting masks to our community, I think it's a really important question. Um, I am going to defer to Dr. Caldwell, who's in the room there, um, to, to maybe give some information. But in, in short, um, until we learn more about the masks, um, I, 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 I wouldn't um, use them. So thank you. And I'll defer to Dr. Caldwell there, if you don't mind. Dr. Caldwell. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jahangir. Uh, Right now, we are waiting for further guidance from the Tennessee Department of Health. I know that they're working with TEMA, CDC, and the EPA on next steps. Uh, we're disappointed uh, in the fact that we cannot use these masks right now. We've been asked not to distribute them. Uh, we will have to wait. Uh, we were hoping to hear by now, but we, we hope to hear soon on what their plan is. And uh, we very much want to make sure that if these masks can't be used, that we find other ways to get masks out to the public. Thank you. Well, thank you, Harriet. Well, let me spend a little bit of time on different aspects of your um, important question. Um, the MOU uh, that we were able to accomplish with the police department and the the COB, I think, was an important step. I think everybody needs to be aware that we are creating a very important institution in Nashville life, but like all things, it's to make it routine what the processes should be in order to make it effective. Um, take some working out. Every day there's a new fact pattern as people explore um, how the police department and the city and this important institution of the COB works together. There's state laws, there's TBI, there's protocol, there's procedures, there's evidence trails, there's um, a lot of court processes that end up being uh, important things to consider and our legal director Bob Cooper and um, the COB have made a lot of progress but there is a lot of learning to do together. There is the commitment to make that effective. In terms of spending uh, in this budget, I mean, we're obviously a few days away, a couple of weeks away from the conclusion of this budget talks. That's why I so welcome uh, working and talking really every day with uh, Minority Caucus members to get their concerns, the people's concerns, the community concerns balanced in this budget. This is a process particularly in the week ahead, that we're all committed to listening to each other and listen to, their re to the representation of those communities and make sure those communities and those neighborhoods' voices are felt in this budget. I do want to spend a, just a minute on the budget. Everyone recognizes that this budget is not accomplishing what we all went into local government to try to do. Unfortunately, this budget is to get us through COVID with the dramatic loss in revenue with the city. We tried to accomplish that with several goals in mind, to have continuity of service, to not have dramatic layoffs or furloughs of um, employees in Metro to repair our cash needs as the city's reserves have essentially been zeroed out by even just the first phase of COVID. To be responsible, and, and it's a leadership moment for the city to 
be able to do that. Um, we would like to have other easier alternatives to a property tax increase, but that is not the responsible action to have a great city on the other side at this time. We are not going to be able to borrow our way out of this. But so if slowing down or does not mean a lack of recognition of our community priorities, and as I've said to almost every member of the minority caucus, they and I look forward to when we can resume to address those priorities going forward. Um, that's the excitement in our lives, um, why we went into city service, and uh, it's devastating not to be able to do it now, but frankly, you have a $566 million adjustment in the city budget, and tell, let me tell you, that is just completely unprecedented. Now, as to the specifics of the diversity officer, we, you know, we're sorting through with the tornado. Uh, a lot of what we had planned to do had come to us to a pause. We've been hoping to make important announcements in this regard and in other announcements. It's a little bit hard in phase one of COVID to, you know, be recruiting and retaining and changing your own officer. But there is a deeper finding that I think has been motivating. It is not going to be just the job of the diversity officer to bring diversity to Nashville, Tennessee. That is the job of every single person in the government. You know, this question is not one diversity officer, but how many diversity officers? And then what are they really doing to accomplish those goals? Those are the hard questions. The era of just having a diversity officer and thinking that you're good, it, it, we're over with that, right? Uh, to be a great city on the other side of that, that's going to be incorporating that fundamentally to the city going forward at every level. That is a super hard thing to do. And yes, do we need to get on with it? Yes, for sure. But I'm grateful for your question because this is an exciting thing to think that through the other side of the crises, can we get to a greater city on the other end of it? And that's our determination to do that. Um, it's our opportunity. It's super hard every day, for sure, but let's get that done. Thank you, Harriet. Those are all the questions in the uh, WebEx queue today. I'd like to thank Dr. Hildreth, Deputy Mayor Haywood, and Chief Anderson for joining us this morning. The next scheduled Metro COVID-19 press briefing will air on Monday, June 8th at 9.30 a.m., Daily updates will be posted at covid19.nashville.gov. Thank you for joining us. This concludes today's press briefing. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.